my name is Professor Peter Nash from Griffith University in beautiful downtown Brisbane. And today we're very lucky to be joined by Dr. Kim Lauper from the Division of Rheumatology, Department of Internal Medicine, uh, Geneva University in Geneva in Switzerland. Welcome, Dr. Lauper. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, thank you for having me here um, for, for this podcast. So today we're going to be talking about her recent paper published in ARD earlier this year, and it's looking at real-world effectiveness of the BDMARDs, TNFs, Batacep, the IL-6 inhibitors, and very topical at the moment, the JAK inhibitors uh, in rheumatoid arthritis from 19 registries called the JAK-POT collaboration. So let's just start by, can you introduce yourself a little bit and tell us a bit about yourself and your research? Yeah, so I'm a consultant in rheumatology at the Geneva University Hospital, uh, and I'm also a clinical researcher, and I work a lot with registers, uh, particularly collaboration of registers. Um, in, so we work data, observational data. I uh, worked before with uh, collaboration of registers around tocilizumab, and now we have this collaboration of register uh, around several um, treatments treatment for RA, but we added JAK inhibitors. So. Okay, so we'll talk about the jackpot collaboration very soon. Can you tell us a little bit about the DMARD climate in Switzerland, and particularly following oral surveillance, whether the JAK use has changed significantly in Switzerland? So I don't think it has changed a lot uh, since uh, the, the oral surveillance. Um, we, before oral surveillance, we already had some, um, 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 we, we were aware that we had to be a bit more careful with patients that were older or things like that. So that's something that we already, already did. Uh, and it's still the case. And I, I think the JAK inhibitor, that, a very efficacious treatment. And so when we have patients that are well under this treatment, we don't necessarily change it, but we talk uh, about this study and uh, about what it means, but I don't think it changes a lot of practice from day to day. Okay. And the, the RAB DMARD market in Switzerland, I, we're talking about 19 registries in many countries. Yeah. So what's happening in Switzerland is a little bit less important. So tell us about the jackpot collaboration. What is the jackpot collaboration? So it's a collaboration of RA registers uh, from 19 different countries. Um, it's it's a collaboration we, that grew a bit uh, around the year because we had some smaller collaboration um, around uh, rituximab, tocilizumab, abatacept. And then we, we, can, we kind of have a friendly uh, collaboration around several registers and people uh, knew about previous study that we did. And so uh, they were interested in participating in this new collaboration and then we extended. So before we had like seven registers, then 11, and now we have 19 registers, mostly around in Europe, but we also have Canada and uh, other uh, countries that are um, more like um, Middle East or uh, like that. So, um, and the idea is to really look at uh, RA treatments, second light treatments, uh, but in the real world, um, because we have lots of very good study that uh, randomized control studies for new treatments. But usually um, there are two main issues. The first one is that the population in these RCT do not correspond to the one that we have in our day-to-day -day practice because selection criteria are very strict. And the patient we have, they have comorbidity, they are older, uh, and these RCT are less representative to, uh, um, for our patients. And so that was that's one of the reasons why I'm interested in observational data and we have this collaboration. And the other one is that in RCT, you have had to have trials, uh, but generally it's against placebo or CSD marks. And you have maybe a few trials against BD marks, but you don't really know with all the treatment we have now uh, to treat RA, which one to choose because you don't compare them all together. So the idea is to have a wider array of treatment that we compare. And so when 
people put their patients in, are they putting selected patients in or every patient in? And is there any either financial incentive or any way to sort of guarantee that they put everyone in, not just picked ones in? So it's different national registers. So how they include it depends on the register. Um, it's not, the jackpot is not like one register. We have around 90 countries. It's 90 national register that we put together. So in some country, all patients have to be put in the register if they have second line therapy. So you have like national wide. Um, if you want to prescribe a second line therapy, you have to put them in. In other register, it's more like a study where you have like to include until 3,000 patients to uh, evaluate the, the mostly adverse events, but you look also at the CD activity. So you have like until 3,000 patients for each of the second line treatment. Uh, in other register, like in Switzerland, it's like a volunteer. So it's the, the patients and the doctor, uh, they can put the, the, the patient in the register, but it's not mandatory. So it really depends on the register. But um, okay. and yeah. And you've got something like uh, 31,000 treatment courses. Does it all come from a couple of countries or is it very evenly spread across the 19? So no, it's not evenly spread. Uh, they are, so we have nationwide register where they take all the patients and we have smaller register where they, 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 it's volunteer and they have less patient or because it's a smaller country. So it can depend. So that's why it's, it's, it's very, it can be heterogeneous between country. And we know also that how we prescribe treatment can depend on other things in the country. So that's why in the, in the study, we take care to uh, take into account the register. So we stratify by register and only after we merge. So we compare the treatment inside the register and then only after we put them together because there are other things that can, um, uh, can influence. And one of the most important would be the time trend. And you actually say in the paper that you've avoided confounding by time trends so that the most recent treatment comes last, if you know what I mean. So how did you do that? How do you avoid confounding by the time to market a various drug? Yeah. So we only included, uh, so we only included patients that started a treatment. So we don't include patients that uh, have been under a treatment under after a certain time. And we only included patients that started the treatment since Jackie were available in the country. So it could depend on the country because, for example, Switzerland, they have Jackie earlier. So we have patients with TNF that also are included that a bit from earlier time. Um, but in other country, when it's later, we have, have a shorter period uh, where all the patients could have these four class of treatments. We don't include patients uh, with TNFE when there was only TNFE, TNFI available because it doesn't make sense to compare them. Okay, so tell us a little bit about what your primary and secondary outcomes were going to be and how we should interpret them. So the first outcome, it's an outcome that we often use in, um, in observational study with register, it's retention. So retentions, it's the time since we, when the patient started the treatment until he stopped it. And it's an uh, um, outcome that we often use for two reasons. The first one is because it's generally well recorded. The start and the stop date of the treatment is something that it's really good, well recorded in, in register. And the second thing, it's something that it's near from our clinical practice. When we put a patient, uh, when we prescribe a treatment, we were like, is it, is it going to stay with this? Are they going to stay with this treatment or will we have to change in like uh, two months? So um, that's why. So the retention, uh, it's, it's something that looks at the effectiveness, how effective the drug is, but there's also a measure of safety because we can stop for ineffectiveness, but also other reasons. So it's like a complex measure, but it's very interesting for clinical practice. Agreed. It's a nice surrogate for doing well and staying on drug and not getting side effects and coming off drugs. So, and in the real world, that, that'll be helpful information. So can you tell us a little bit about the secondary endpoints? 
so the two secondary endpoints we looked into was uh, first uh, um, uh, disease activity, and we use CDI for that uh, because uh, it's less uh, um, influenced by uh, inflammatory markers, as we had uh, IF6 inhibitors, uh, uh, one of the category. And then another secondary endpoint was uh, the reason for treatment discontinuations, because we had retention as an overall measure, but we wanted to look a bit more about the reason why the patient stopped the treatment. Was it an uh, adverse event? Was it ineffectiveness? What were its other reasons? And you looked at many covariants, often very interesting ones, seropositivity, gender is very topical now, particularly in the PSA world, disease duration, steroid use, methotrexate use. So that those are with the incidence see how they influence the results. And tell us a bit about the baseline characteristics of these patients. What, the, what were these patients like? So um, we looked at several covariate, baseline covariates of the patients, um, but it was mostly to adjust for them because we can see that uh, the patients who, uh, to whom we prescribed uh, IL-6 inhibitors are a bit different to the patients who we prescribe uh, TNF inhibitors. Patients with TNF inhibitors tends to be younger, uh, with less disease duration than the other uh, non-TNFI uh, RA treatments. So these were really important covariant because we not it, the patients are not randomized. So uh, we have to take into account that this population can be a bit different. So we have to adjust for all these covariates. Uh, it's something that's really important in observational study. Otherwise, you if you compare TNF patients with non-TNFI non patients, uh, they're really different and you're just comparing apples and orange and you don't know if your outcome is different because the population is different uh, at the start or it's really the outcome which is different. I agree entirely because if you look at that baseline table, these people have still had 9 to 11 years of disease, 80% mm -hmm. zero pods. And just if you look at the JACs, 30% of them had already failed three biologics. Yeah, exactly. Whereas only 10% of the TNFs. And if you look at the JACs, a third of them were monotherapy, whereas with the TNFs, it was a much smaller percentage yeah. um, that was monotherapy. So these things are pretty important. Um, even comorbidities were different. I don't know if it's statistically significant, but the JACs, 50% had comorbidities and the TNFs, 43%. So all those things would, you know, would be very interesting to see how it affects the outcome and your interpretation. So tell us about the main outcomes of your study. So the main outcome is retention. Um, and as we said previously, we, uh, we, we had 19 registers that, a bit diff that were a bit different. So what we did is that we uh, took all this register, we compared the drug in, inside the register and we adjusted inside the register, which is uh, very strong because we have less influence on the register on the overall outcome. Because if you compare more patients with TNFI in one country against uh, patients IL-6 with IL-6 inhibitors in another country, um, they're too different. So that's how we did. And then we meta-analyzed the, the, all this register to see if the retention was different between the, the, the four treatments. And we didn't find any, any difference. So uh, when we adjust for all these confounding factors, including country, we don't find difference in retention. But um, the other thing is because we did like that, we cannot look at, really look at the influence of each of these covariates on the outcome, because for this, we would have to uh, merge all together and, 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 uh, if, and not do it by country. So we were not able to look at this, all these covariates uh, and how they influence the outcome. Uh, it has been done in other studies, for example, on one register, but we, we were not able to do it in this one. So that's very interesting because we often ask, do the seronegative patients respond as well as the seropositives? You know, being on methotrexate different to not being on methotrexate. Can you comment on any of those or, or because of the limitations you can't really so We cannot do, in, in, in our study, we did not look at that because we were not able to. We know from other studies that, um, uh, uh, that rituximab and abatacept patient will be more influenced uh, the, the, the seropositive has more influence uh, on, on their response than for uh, TNFI or, or IL-6 inhibitors. But it's not something we looked here. We were not able, but we adjust 
we adjusted for it uh, on purpose because it could influence uh, the retention. Okay. And so all this, all this um, baseline characteristics that we know uh, can influence the, the, the retention, we adjusted for them, but we were not able to look into them. So the numbers are quite big and the retention was fairly good amongst all of them. I don't know about good, but it was equivalent amongst all of them. Were there any differences in the secondary outcomes that you saw? So yeah, we saw small differences in the secondary outcome. So for disease activity, it was almost similar. Maybe abatacept had a slightly uh, lower uh, response, but it was not really very important, like 5%. Um, but, um, and then for the when we looked at the secondary outcome of uh, looking at what were the reasons of discontinuation, we found some difference. So for abatacept and TNFI, we didn't find any difference for the reasons of uh, for the for discontinuation. Uh, but for IL six and uh, TNFI or Jackie and TNFI, we saw that maybe there were a bit more uh, discontinuous for ineffectiveness for non TNFI and uh, less. Uh, no, less for ineffectiveness, sorry, and more for adverse events. But it was not really big differences. So it, it may be a trend, or maybe it's just because we have big numbers that we see a statistical difference as well. And, you know, the safety things, was there any signal? Could you see if the VTE thing came through with the TNFs? So one of one of the limitations is we don't have the, um, the detail for reasons of discontinuation in all patients. We have like a third of the patient for which we don't have the reason of discontinuation because it's not always registered in the, a recorder in the registers. Um, so that's already a limitation. There might be a selection bias for the patient for which we have the information. And uh, the other thing is we people record uh, adverse events, but we don't know if it's a serious one, is it just a small one? We, we can't really know. Um, that's the other reason. And the third reason, the third thing is that it's it's not really big difference in hazard ratio. So I wouldn't do too much conclusion on this on this secondary outcome at the moment. It, it, I think it's it really is not. Uh, um, yeah, it's, it, there are several factors that can influence this. So we need more studies that will really look into the safety more, more, um, more specifically. Are you going to be able to, or the, or the way it's set up, you'll never be able to look at that? So that's the aim. We, that's the aim of the, of, the, of the collaboration. The next step is really to look into the safety. Um, but he, we need... The safety, the issue is adverse events are rare, so we, we, we need to have more, uh, lots of numbers to see differences or no, no differences. So, but yeah, it's the aim. Yeah. We are looking at that at the moment. So we hope. But the implications are pretty important. Yeah, the implications are. So, <laughs> especially now EMEA is having a big review of the JACs and they're going to come down with some crazy decision like the FDA did, you know. All jacks, all indications, even though there's one jack in one RA study. So, <clears throat> can you give us some take home messages from your study, the conclusions that you came to? Yeah, so I think that at the moment we don't see any difference in effectiveness in the real world patients. All this treatment seems to be pretty similar in terms of effectiveness. So if we need to choose a treatment between these four categories, we have to uh, choose that on other, um, on other uh, things than, than effectiveness. Um, patient's preference, safety when we have more data. Um, uh, so they are pretty similar for effectiveness. And <clears throat> where are you going to go with this in the future, this research? What's the plans coming up with all this data? So the plan is safety. All looking at uh, at cardiovascular events, uh, cancer, uh, infections. So that's really the plan, and it's really why we did this collaboration. But um, we we started with effectiveness because it was um, a way to start this collaboration, and the data are easier to look into for effectiveness. We have retention, uh, which is really a, a great outcome for observational data. Um, because looking at safety among 19 different registers will be more of a challenge for this. But, but at the same time, we have 
more than 30,000 patients. So it's, it's like a real opportunity to look into that. I agree, real world data is um, so important because most of our patients could never get into a clinical trial because of this contraindication or that co-medication or that issue. So we look forward to the future and for us, for you to give us some clear indications about safety. So thank you very much for your time, Kim. Um, if you'd like to know more about this paper and others uploaded to the CSF website this month, you can get detailed slides that's available in the publication section at cytokinesignaling.com. Please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast media and give us some feedback and let us know what you think. Thank you so much for your time. It's greatly appreciated. And we look forward to the future results from this big project of yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.